Turn to Mark chapter 5, please. Mark's Gospel, chapter 5. I'll give you um, my message points to begin with, if you're a note taker. The first is this, you are not so hopeless that you'll be forgotten. Secondly, you are not so weak that you'll be forsaken. Thirdly, you are not so sick that you can't be healed. Don't get nervous on the last point, we'll talk about that. You are not so sick you can't be healed. Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse 21, hear the word of the Lord. When Jesus had crossed over again by a boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the sea. One of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, my little daughter is dying. Come and lay your hands on her so that she can get well and live. So Jesus went with him. And a large crowd was following and pressed against him. Now, a woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years had endured much under many doctors. She had spent everything she had and was not helped at all. On the contrary, she became worse. Having heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothing. For she said, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be made well. Instantly, her flow of blood ceased. And she sensed in her body that she was healed of her affliction. At once, Jesus realized in himself that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing against you, and yet you say, who touched me? But he was looking around to see who had done this. The woman, with fear and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be healed from your affliction. While he was still speaking, people came from the synagogue leader's house and said, your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? When Jesus overheard what was said, he told the synagogue leader, don't be afraid, only believe. He did not let anyone accompany him except Peter, James, and John, James's brother. They came to the leader's house, and he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, but he put them all outside. He took the child's father, mother, and those who were with him and entered the place where the child was. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kumi, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl got up and began to walk. She was 12 years old. At this, they were utterly astounded. Then he gave them strict orders that no one should know about this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. I ask that you would press it deep into our hearts this morning. Help us to have our affections for your son stirred, our faith in you strengthened, and our vision of the glory of your son to be so clear and so bright and so satisfying. It's in his great name, the name of Jesus Christ, we pray these things. Amen. Uh, I I don't know about you, but probably there's more than a few of you in here like me. You hate to wait. I hate to wait. Really for anything. I hate to wait in line to the grocery store. I feel like the process should be much more efficient than it already is. The express line is a lie. I, I don't fall for it. I hate to wait in lines for, the, for a restroom. I hate to wait in line for anything. I hate to wait for stuff to arrive that I've ordered, even with prime shipping. Two days, that's too long. Where's the drone bringing me my stuff? I hate to wait for a table, and then once I'm at the table, I hate to wait for my food to arrive. I hate to wait for the microwave to ding. We have microwavable food now, and we hate to wait. I stand at the microwave and watch the seconds go by and think, these seconds are much too long. My microwave is broken. I especially hate to wait when the promise is quickness and the delivery seems slow. Yesterday, I was in the Denver airport, 
trying to come home, you're waiting for a train to get from the terminal to baggage claim, and it tells you very helpfully, or so they think, on the sign, how long you have to wait before the train gets there. And I walk up and it says two minutes. Two minutes does not seem like a long time. And then two minutes goes by and it still says two minutes. And then in five minutes, it still says two minutes. And I think their sign is broken. And while I'm thinking about who I should contact to complain about their sign, finally the train arrives. I hate to wait. But waiting is unfortunately an essential part of life. Some psychologists, in fact, will say that Waiting, the ability to wait, right? One of the marks of maturity is the ability to delay gratification. Maybe you've heard of the Stanford marshmallow experiment, right? They they bring all these little kids into a room by themselves and they put one marshmallow on the table in front of them. And they say, if you can wait, just wait till I return, you can have two marshmallows. But if you eat this marshmallow before I get back, That's all you get, just the one. And they put the marshmallow there right underneath their nose and eyes and they walk out of the room and they videotape these kids while they sit in there staring at the marshmallow. The longest the wait is is 15 minutes, 15 minutes, but they don't know that. They just know when I come back, if you can wait and the marshmallow is still there, I'll give you a second marshmallow. Many kids can't wait. They're unable to fathom that the passage of time would be bearable. They're unable to conceive of the double delectability of two marshmallows. And they end up eating the one put in front of them before the adult returns. Others are tantalized by the prospect of two marshmallows, and so they hold out and they squirm and they fidget and if you've seen some of the footage you notice some of them they're like they put a cup over the marshmallow so they can't see it <laughs> or they hide their eyes they kind of put their head down into their arms so they can't see the marshmallow it's it's just tempting them eat me eat me in follow-up studies the researchers discovered that children who were able to wait longer for the preferred rewards tended to have better life outcomes Measured by SAT scores, higher SAT scores, educational attainment, body mass index, and other life measures. Well, okay. But it's a marshmallow. It tastes good. Only one-third of the subjects waited until they could receive the second marshmallow. One-third. That was it. We hate to wait. But waiting is an essential part, not just of life, but of the Christian life. Waiting is, in fact, embedded in the hope of Christianity. Self-control, patience, peace, these are parts of the fruit of the Spirit. And learning to wait is an essential component to Christian ministry. Zach Eswine says that we are addicted to doing big things famously as quickly as possible when Christian ministry is mainly doing small, overlooked things over a long period of time. Nearly all of us have trouble waiting for conveniences. But some of us right now, and all of us at some point, will have trouble waiting for things that are far more important. Reconciliation, maybe. The alleviation of anxiety or worries or fears. Maybe the return of a prodigal. The salvation of a loved one. Maybe it's healing from sickness or disability. And we all wait for that blessed day when pain and grief and even death will be no more. Well, I want to argue that all of this is embedded in Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. We see multiple waits. We see multiple senses of urgency and even of despair. And what we learn primarily is that there is no wait too long for the Lord who is always on time. There is no wait too long for the Lord's children who are never truly in danger. One of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet and he begged him earnestly, my little daughter is dying. Come and lay your hands on her so that she can get well and live. So Jesus went with him and a large crowd was following and pressing against him. Now a woman, and this is interesting because there's this interruption here, a narrative break in a sense a story within the story 
And both Matthew and Luke, who give us this depiction, show us the narrative happening in this way as well. So we know this is actually how it happened. Mark's not inserting the story in the bigger story for some kind of dramatic effect. The Lord is doing that for some kind of dramatic effect. But Mark, I find this really interesting, Mark's gospel, which is the briefest of the gospels, has the longest version of this story. Mark's gospel, which famously is known for its repetition of the word immediately. Mark's gospel, which has almost a a breakneck pace to it. Mark's gospel, which skips the birth narrative and jumps right into the action. Mark's gospel, which ends suddenly and dramatically. Mark's gospel, which N.T. Wright says ought to be read in a cave by torchlight with one's co-conspirators. Mark's gospel slows down to depict this incident in its longest biblical depiction. Why do you suppose that is? Mark, who is in a hurry, will slow down for this important event to show how Jesus would often slow down for an important event. Jesus is a master at the ministry of interruption. Those of you who are aspiring to pastoral ministry or just ministry in general, take note. You'll be tempted many times to think that the interruptions to your agenda are impediments to your ministry. And what you discover is that the interruptions are your ministry. Once visited a dear lady from my church in the hospital and she just seemed utterly surprised that I would walk into the room. She said, I can't believe that you would come visit me. And I said, why? She said, you're just so busy. You're always doing so many things. And I said, well, you're right, but... This is what I'm busy doing. This is the ministry. Now this woman has had a discharge of blood for 12 years. In an interesting parallel, the little girl Jesus has been asked to heal, we later learn, is 12 years old. The woman has suffered for 12 years. You don't think she was tired of waiting? She had suffered much under many physicians. She spent all that she had, but she was no better. Rather, she grew worse. And we don't know exactly what the discharge of blood was, but we can know a couple of things just from reading the description that's here. First is that she had been suffering a long time and nobody could help her. She had looked for help and the help that she received only made her worse. We also know that in the Jewish religion, a discharge of blood makes you unclean, untouchable. Leviticus chapter 15, verse 25, if a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of the discharge she shall continue in uncleanness. As in the days of her impurity, she shall be unclean. This woman for 12 years has not just lived with the pain, the anguish, the fear, the anxiety, but the reality that she is shamed untouchable, considered by those around her, in essence, toxic. And so she's lived in this pain, she's lived in this anguish, she's lived in this shame, personally, emotionally, spiritually, religiously, for over a decade. Day after day, all her money and all her time has been given to solving this problem, and it's only made it worse. Maybe you're thinking of a parallel for your own life. Maybe you've waited a long time for some problem, some concern, some illness to go away. Or maybe you just think because everybody else succeeds and you don't, or everybody else seems important and you don't, or everybody else has whatever you don't have, you wonder if waiting even makes any sense anymore. Or at least waiting with any kind of hope if that makes sense anymore. Does it matter to you that the question, how long, O Lord, occurs throughout the Psalms and the prophets? I don't know what your situation or your grief is, but here's what I do know. You are not so hopeless you'll be forgotten. Maybe you think Jesus only cares about the important people. I know theologically you don't think that, but situationally, That seems to be the case, if only because everybody else around you only cares for the important people. 
Isn't it great that while all those Star Trek nerds are at the Evangelical Theological Society this week, Jesus is able to meet with us here in regular old chapel? It's good he's there too, but I'm glad he's here with us. Jairus was a ruler. He comes as an important man to an important man and addresses him directly. But Jesus makes time for the unclean woman. Imagine if her 12 years of waiting had culminated with this encounter only to see Jesus walk away out of reach. Or Jesus to turn around and to rebuke her. I mean, she has to feel almost beyond hope by now. And she's likely mustered up every ounce of hope she's got left just to make that reach. And she discovers, praise God, that she is not outside the scope of Christ's redemption. Indeed, nobody is, provided they want it from him. And we see the same truth over and over again with who Jesus fraternized with, right? People in the margins, people on the outskirts of polite society and acceptable decorum. We see it in the way he welcomes both women of ill repute and little children with nothing to offer. Brothers and sisters, when you tug on Jesus' garment, he doesn't sigh or roll his eyes. He loves to be pestered. But many who are first will be last, and the last first, he says. But 12 years is a long time, isn't it? Especially when each day feels like an eternity. Think of the man by the pool at Bethesda who waited paralyzed for 38 years. 38 years while day after day people stepped over him to get their magic. 38 years, and when the Lord shows up, John's gospel tells us instantly the man got well. There are no little people in the kingdom of God. I wonder if she felt the wait was worth it. 12 years, I wonder, whatever situation is in your mind right now, whatever parallel you are feeling in your bones or in your heart, how long have you been waiting How long have you been wondering if the Lord really cares? How long have you wondered if he actually loves you? If maybe somehow you've slipped through the cracks, like maybe he's forgotten about you, like maybe he's got more important things to do or more important people to deal with. Well, the God of the universe is omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent, and you may be at the end of your rope, but that is where most people discover Jesus is more than able to sustain you. You are not so hopeless that you'll be forgotten. The Lord sees, the Lord knows. Secondly, you are not so weak that you'll be forsaken. You are not so weak that you'll be forsaken. Jairus came, verse 22, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. This is interesting because earlier in the chapter, in verse 6, the demoniac does the exact same thing. Falling down at the feet of Jesus seems to be an essential part of faith. And he implores him earnestly, verse 23, saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her so she may be made well and live. You'll also notice, if you have your Bible open, the herdsmen at the end of the previous narrative begging Jesus to leave, go away from us, verse 17. And Jairus is saying, please come. Please come help. The herdsmen are fearing Jesus' sovereignty. The other is depending on it. He's hanging his hope on it. He refers to his girl as my little daughter. Later we learn that she's 12 years old. She's not really that little anymore. But when you're a dad, they're always little. There's a term of endearment here that shows the dad's deep affection for her. And it's echoed by Jesus later. And there's a sense of urgency here. Jairus, as a ruler in the synagogue, may be at the end of his rope. 
And we could theorize that based on a couple of things. This is just imagination brought into the text. It may not be true. This is just my speculation. But he comes to Jesus when his daughter is near death, right, we know. So this is essentially his last resort. We can assume, maybe, that if Jesus' regular interactions with religious leaders are any indication, Jairus may not be totally sympathetic to Jesus' cause. Or he may fear that Jesus is not totally sympathetic to his Maybe neither is the case, but in any event, he realizes Jesus is his only hope in this moment. And so all of that gets set aside. Decorum, religious debate, he's come to exercise faith. And so he comes and he falls at Jesus' feet and begs him. He's desperate. And then, as Jesus goes to help him, we have the interruption Having heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothing. Matthew and Luke's gospel tell us the fringe or the tassel of his clothing. For she said, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be made well. And as soon as she does, instantly, her flow of blood ceased. And she sensed in her body that she was healed of her affliction. At once, Jesus realized in himself that power had gone out from him. And first of all, isn't that awesome? That's just kind of cool. So he turns around and he says, who touched my clothes? Now this is rather interesting. We want to ask the question, does Jesus not know? He's the son of God. He has all the divine attributes incarnate, including omniscience. Perhaps this is some example, another example of a self-limitation of knowledge. The Son of God does not know the day or the hour, that sort of thing. Maybe that's what it is, but I think maybe it's something else. Maybe an echo of Genesis chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord comes to call Adam and Eve to account, and he says, where are you? Did God not know where they were? No, of course he did. It's very possible Jesus knows exactly who touched him. But in asking the question, He is creating a reckoning. He wants to provoke faith in the woman. He wants to strengthen her faith, in fact. His disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing against you and you say, who touched me? But he's looking around to see who had done this. And the woman, with fear and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And this is what Jesus says to her. Daughter, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be healed from your affliction. So what we have here in the story, embedded in the story, is this. Two portraits of faith. There's some part of this story that indicates that the woman wasn't entirely trusting. That she thought if she showed herself, she would be utterly rejected. Why would she think that? Well, it's a logical conclusion based on the fact that for 12 years she's been utterly rejected. And she knew that Jesus could heal her, but she didn't know if he would or if he wanted to. And yet the love that Jesus shows her, even when she's tried to steal a blessing, in essence, shows his interest in her. You are not so weak that you'll be forsaken. Two portraits of faith. Jairus comes fully convinced. He approaches Jesus directly. The woman believes Jesus can heal, doesn't know if Jesus will heal, and so she comes by stealth. And when confronted, she is full of fear and trembling. But how does he refer to the woman? Verse 34, daughter. That's really important. Daughter. This woman who is likely experienced being cast off, cut off. The stigma, the shame following her like a cloud. That the Lord of the universe wouldn't just say to her, woman, or you, but would call her daughter. I believe there's a little bit of healing in that. 
And what we see from these two portraits of faith is this. A weak faith and a strong faith receive the same measure of grace. Two portraits of faith, one strong, one weak, but both receive the healing. Augustus Toplady, perhaps best known for writing the hymn Rock of Ages, in his sermon on assurance, which I highly recommend, says this. He says, a weak finger can receive a wedding ring. And he says, a feeble faith may lay bold on a strong Christ. You don't need a strong faith to be saved. You just need a true faith. You don't need a strong faith. You don't even need a big faith. Jesus said you could have faith the size of a mustard seed so long as it's real. You don't need a strong faith. You just need a strong gospel. Because it's not a strong faith that saves, but a strong Savior. You are not so weak that you'll be forsaken. There's time even for you. Maybe Jairus knows this, I don't know, but just picture him in this moment because he's now in the background of the scene. He started the whole thing. My daughter's dying, come heal her. Jesus goes to leave with him. Then he is interrupted and Jairus is just standing back there watching this whole thing unfold. He has come to Jesus out of urgency. Jesus urgently turns to go with him. Then he gets interrupted. Is Jairus standing there waiting patiently or impatiently? This woman's waited for 12 years. Maybe she could wait a little longer. My daughter's dying. As far as we know, he says nothing. The text doesn't show him saying anything or interjecting. And as his fear is gathering... His worst fears come true. While Jesus has delayed the very thing he wanted Jesus to prevent from taking place occurs. While he was still speaking, verse 35, people came from the synagogue and they said, your daughter's dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? When Jesus overheard what was said, he told the synagogue leader, don't be afraid. Only believe. Now I wonder what Jairus is thinking this whole time as a father of daughters. He's issued no objection, but surely he has a growing anxiety. And now what he has feared could happen has happened. But Jesus has a word for it. When it looks like the worst case scenario, the one thing that you feared would happen happens. What does Jesus say? Don't be afraid. When Christ is involved, the worst case scenario is never as bad as it seems. In fact, you are not so sick that you can't be healed. You are not so sick that you can't be healed. So what does he do? He didn't let anyone accompany him except Peter, James, and John, James's brother. And they came to the leader's house and he saw a commotion. People are weeping and they're wailing loudly. Matthew in his gospel tells us that the professional mourners have shown up. The flute players, etc., And he went in and said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? This child's not dead. She's asleep. Wait a minute, Jesus, didn't you hear the news? Can't you see the mourners? She's dead. It's too late. And here is a reminder, um, brothers and sisters, that we ought not set our sights so low. Because despite what the world thinks, there are worse things than dying. Because Jesus is Lord over life and death, the death of your body is no hindrance to him. And this is a concept lost even in the church, I think. We, we have forgotten that the blessed hope is not simply going to heaven when we die, but receiving an imperishable body at the resurrection to come. Every resurrection in the scriptures is in fact a picture of that moment. We had at my last church, um, the historic old cemetery right across the street, catty corner from the town green. And I would often walk over some of the gravestones would date back to the early 1700s. And I would read, they knew how to put stuff on tombstones back then. Little poems. And if you could make them out from the weathering on the stones, you could really find some helpful theology. 
I've written down a couple for posterity. Death, my friends, is nothing frightful, one of those Middletown Cemetery tombstones reads, if we're prepared to go. Jesus makes all things delightful when we leave this world of woe. How about this? This is um, Lamson Miner's tombstone. Lamson Miner died September 2nd, 1806. He was 32. Sudden and unexpected, I was summoned to this solitary mansion. And then it says, Ho, ho, beware, beware, for time is hastening. I shall soon wake on that consummate morn. That's, that's beautiful. He's just sleeping. If Christ's work is true, we need to radically reevaluate our conception of death. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And if we are in Christ, there is nothing he will take from us that he will not give back to us in some way a millionfold. And for the faithful, this is real comfort. For the worldly, this is foolishness. They laughed at him. They laughed at him, but he put them all outside. And I love that. And I don't know what it means if he just asked them to leave, but I'm picturing him kicking people in the butts out the door. Can I say butts? So he takes the child's father and mother and those who are with him and he enters the place where the child was and he took the child by the hand and he said to her, Talitha kumi, which is translated little girl, I say to you, get up. What is Jesus doing? He's echoing the father's affection, not just Jairus, but the father. Talitha is a term of endearment. Literally, it means little girl. But in that day, in that language, in that time, it's, it has more connotation for us of something like sweetie or honey. Do you see what Jesus is doing here? The girl has died, but because he is Jesus the Lord, God incarnate, in the flesh, sovereign over life and death, the head of all rule and authority, the alpha and the omega, the first and the last, the sustainer of the universe by a mere word from his lips, he is treating her like it's time to get up for breakfast and go to school. Sweetie, it's time to get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk. She's 12 years old. At this, they were utterly astounded. I should say so. Some of you know that my wife and I have two daughters. We have two daughters who are living. But we have one who, who passed away in between, our second child. And I remember the first signs that something was wrong. It was 4th of July weekend. And it was cause enough to head to the doctor for some answers. And I remember vividly sitting in this dim ultrasound room where a technician was running the sonogram probe over my wife's pregnant belly. And a technician had an assistant with her and they talked about it in really harsh tones. They're whispering. When they're whispering, you know, this, this isn't good. And they said nothing to us that I recall. They discussed what they were seeing and what they weren't seeing. And they were keeping us in the dark until the doctor could come speak to us. And that's exactly how it felt. It felt like sitting in the dark. And later the doctor came and confirmed that we had lost our child. It's not an uncommon experience, those of you who've been through it. The shock is profound and people deal with it in different ways. I couldn't think, I couldn't feel. I remember as we sat there in the examination room just numb, this male nurse comes walking into the room and he made a joke and neither one of us responded and then he made a joke about us being a tough crowd and I want to think now that he just didn't know what we were dealing with, he didn't know what news we just received, otherwise he wouldn't have said what he said or maybe he just hadn't been well trained in bedside manner but in any event it was so callous, and if I'd had the energy, I would have let him have it. But I just sat there and seethed, and it felt like death was making fun of us. Becky's shock lasted for several days, the grief for more days thereafter. Eventually, outpouring of emotions came. I spent an entire day in bed just sobbing. It was the 4th of July weekend. 
And we decided to name our baby Angel. And in case you're wondering, it's not because we believe that when people die, they become angels. But we just thought it's our baby in heaven. And we thought one of these days we'll be reunited with her. And a year later, um, Becky became pregnant again. And it was a very, very difficult pregnancy. There was stress and some other factors that was complicating our baby's growth. And Becky was going through a lot of discomfort and anxiety. The doctor had ordered that she would work from home. And after the miscarriage, we were really scared about how things would turn out. And our, our second daughter was carried all the way to term. I remember her birth, however. I had a video camera there in the delivery room. And I remember as our baby was born, um, the room fell silent, mainly because our baby was silent. And I could see a look of panic on the nurse's face as she hustled our daughter over to the little bassinet and began to try to clear out her lungs. And she wasn't crying. She couldn't breathe. And I remember thinking, this, this can't be how this turns out. The more frantic the nurse looked, the more frightened I got. But eventually, climactically, our daughter let out the most beautiful wail that I have ever heard. And we named her Grace. And she was born on July 5th, exactly one year and one day from the passing of our little angel. And we have learned ever since that grace has a timing of her own. And God's grace has a timing of its own. And it is never late. In my retrospective fantasies, Jesus comes into that somber examination room on July 3rd, 2002, and he takes that moron nurse by the arm and he puts him outside. <laughs> there will come a day when those who mock the faithful, who jeer at them for both their grief and their hope, will get their comeuppance. If it seems to take too long, do not doubt that it's coming. The church will not suffer the derision of the world one second longer than God has planned. And in a splendid vision of exulting triumph, the Lord will put the jawing and the sneering away. And he will take his children by the hand and he will deliver them. Talitha Kumi, little girl, I say to you, get up. And all of the grief, all of the pain, all of the fear, all of the weight of the entire brokenness of the world brought down to the finest point in the hush of gentle words. It's time to get up, honey. Like the wild storm immediately calming at his command, Jesus instantaneously makes death stop. Now God has given me two beautiful growing daughters. I believe he wanted us to have daughters, so I picture angels smile like I picture her mother, sparkling blue eyes like her mother's, a gentle wisp of a hand. And perhaps Christ will grant in our reunion this little fantasy of mine that when my life on this earth is no more, whether it's a minute from now or 50 years from now, I will wake to the wonder of his glorious might and his all-consuming presence and maybe angel will be at my side holding my hand and in her heavenly tongue saying, it's time to get up, Daddy. Maybe your experience of the Christian life is one in which you don't feel fully embraced by Christ because you believe he has obligated himself to love you. Well, he has, but not in the way that you think. All my life I felt like the Lord is obligated to love me. He has painted himself in a corner. The gospel is a loophole that I've exploited. He loves me because he has to. No, no, no. He owes you nothing. Which means that the fact that he loves you is a huge deal. And that his love is the kind of love that has affection. That he likes you even. And that he has plans for you. You may not be healed of physical affliction this side of the veil. But you who are in Christ will be healed of physical affliction for eternity. The bleeding woman and Jairus' daughter both had to die eventually. Lazarus had to die again. Everybody Jesus healed and everybody Jesus raised went on to die. A reminder not to set our sights too low. Because what really ails you and what will really kill you is the sin that separates you from a holy God. 
And the reason Christ has come is not primarily to make sick people well, but dead people live. And the death that is the wages of sin is far worse than the death that is the wages of a broken world. And yet Christ can heal you from even the second death. There is no sin too great for his grace. His sacrifice on the cross is sufficient for you. His blood is more than enough for your pardon. And your greatest disease is your sin. But Christ's cross and resurrection are proof you are not so sick that you cannot be healed. One thing we learn from the interruption is that on the way to resurrection, our salvation is part of the story. On his way to raise Jairus' daughter from the dead, Jesus heals the woman and makes her part of the story. And so the narrative is a micro picture of the bigger story. Jesus is on his way to die and rise again. Along the way, he's teaching and healing and exercising demons, and he's eating and sleeping, and he's welcoming and worshiping. He has a plan. He's going to get there at the right time. But in the meantime, there's time. And all who desire his touch will get it. And so we rush headlong toward the second coming of Christ. There is time enough for the salvation of all who will trust in him. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness. He is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so your healing from disability or illness, or just from the ordinary pain of living in a broken world, may not come for a long, long time. But your healing from sin can be part of the story now if you'll come and get it this very morning. For those of you who are redeemed by Christ's blood and yet still suffer from some ailment, if you feel forgotten in the waiting, remember, he will never leave you or forsake you. He is coming quickly. And even if you die, yet shall you live. Those who believe in him will never die. The love of Christ is so deep, there is more than enough for you if you want it. So here's the question I leave you with. Do you want it? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray I be forgiven for pushing the time. It feels odd to rush, so we preach about waiting. I pray that the joy of you would be caused to pause and exult. Bring the lost to salvation. Bring the found to greater faith in you. I thank you that it's not a weak faith that saves, but a strong Savior. It's in your son's great name that we pray these things. Amen.